Hello, and welcome to this talk. My name is Lester Hightower, and today I'm going to speak a little bit about insulin dose titration tips that my wife and I use with my son using a multiple daily injection regimen for insulin and following Dr. Richard K. Bernstein's diabetes solution management regimen. So I'd like to start by saying that managing type 1 diabetes is hard work, but great success is possible, and I really think it's worth it primarily because well-controlled diabetes is the leading cause of nothing. This presentation shares tips and tricks that are useful to my family, but this presentation is not intended to be medical advice and please do not take it as such. So my son, Andrew, is my type one diabetes connection. Andrew was diagnosed at the age of five and he is now 16 years old. This slide shows uh, Andrew's type 1 diabetes journey, uh, illustrated by an A1C graph, uh, which you can see his A1Cs for the last 11 years, uh, graphed behind uh, photographs of Andrew starting at the age of 5 and running through, uh, he's now 16, the picture in the bottom right there, uh, he was actually 15. So this shows you sort of the stages of life that we've walked Andrew through with type 1 diabetes and the A1C values that he's achieved following Dr. Bernstein's uh, diabetes management regimen. Um, and prevailing outcomes versus Andrew's A1C's results are pretty stark. So the graph in the middle of this slide is from a paper published in uh, early 2019 that showed prevailing outcomes uh, from type 1 diabetic patients. I've added a couple of lines in between the ages of 5 and 16. Those are the years that we've walked Andrew through with type 1 diabetes, you can see at the age of 5, uh, Andrew's peer group was achieving an A1C of about 8.1%. Now at the age of 16, Andrew's peers are in the 9.3% range in terms of A1C. Uh, in the 11 years that Andrew's had diabetes following Dr. Bernstein's regimen, all of his A1Cs have ranged from 4.7 on the low side and 54 on the high side, and his 11-year average is 4.95%, a fairly stark contrast. So our type 1 diabetes success is pretty low-tech, actually. I'm going to walk you through uh, the tools that we use. On the top left uh, photograph there, you can see a three-ring binder, which holds uh, uh, diabetes management diary pages. You can see one of those to the right hand of the slide there. Uh, in that three-ring binder, on those diary pages, we record the foods that my son eats, uh, his blood sugars before and after meals, and when we test him through the night, his insulin doses, which I actually scrubbed out here because I didn't want anybody sort of trying to follow uh, our exact insulin dose and, uh, your, uh, on their own. Um, and so that's what that book is. On top of uh, that three ring binder is a small little blood sugar um, management book that we get from our diabetes clinic. And it allows my son to carry that book with him, jot down uh, his before and after meal blood sugars, and he uses that at school to help inform his uh, insulin dosing. Uh, in the picture just to the right, you'll see a standard uh, blood sugar meter. Um, and to the bottom left, you'll see the three insulins uh, that my son uses. We'll talk about those a little more in a second. And then to the bottom right, you'll see uh, insulin syringes, which we use daily and glucose, uh, which we use to raise blood sugar. And we'll talk about that just a little more on another slide. So these are the three insulins that Andrew uses. They're all from Novo Nordisk. Levomir is his basal insulin, which is long acting. And he takes that three times per day and it prevents his liver from constantly converting glycogen to glucose. Novo R is a bolus insulin. It's rapid and considered short acting and it's used to cover the food eaten in meals with its primary focus being on protein. Novolog is also a bolus insulin. It's considered ultra rapid and very short acting. It's also used to cover food in, eaten in meals and to rapidly correct unexpected high blood sugars. So my son's multiple daily injection insulin regimen has six scheduled shots, three bolus doses, and then three meal boluses, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And on top of those will be any correction boluses that might be needed to bring down a high blood sugar. So this slide describes the activity profile of various styles of insulin. So regular insulin is shown with the solid purple line. Regular is considered to be short acting 
and it is the only insulin that's non, not been modified from the regular human form. The ultra-rapid insulin shown on this graph are to the left. You can see they have a much more rapid peak and they fall off much more rapidly. Uh, the two shown are Lispro, which the brand name of that is Humalog, and Aspart, which is Novolog. Oh, I'm sorry, there's actually a third as well, which is Glulosan, which is uh, sold under the brand name Apidra. And then the two basal insulins, which are long-acting, uh, are Detamir, which is sold under the brand name Levamir, and Glargon, which is uh, sold under the brand name Lantus. So here's a quick visualization of how a multiple daily injection insulin regimen works. In this particular diagram, instead of three doses of Levamir a day, there are two doses shown. Um, those doses are at 8 a.m. and about 11 p.m. Uh, by looking at the black lines on this graph. And you can see the rapid insulin is giving, given for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. So this diagram is a five shot a day regimen where my son has a, a, a six shot per day regimen. So our blood sugar correction tools are Novolog to correct high blood sugars and we bring those down using the correction factors that I'm going to show you on the following slide. We often use intramuscular injections and we do that particularly if blood sugar is significantly above target or if a meal time is approaching. To raise blood sugar, we only use glucose. And we do that because it does not need to be digested or converted by the liver into anything else. It is glucose, and that's what we're talking about is blood glucose. Uh, it can also be precisely dosed, and we do that uh, as uh, I'm going to show you on the following slide. So people with diabetes really must know how much one unit of a bolus insulin will lower their blood sugar. That's indicative of their insulin sensitivity. And conversely, how much one gram of glucose will raise their blood sugars, their glucose sensitivity. So Andrew's sensitivities differ dramatically daytime versus nighttime. During the day, one unit of Novolog will lower Andrew's blood glucose about 40 milligrams per deciliter. But overnight, the same one unit of Novolog will only lower his blood sugar about 12 milligrams per deciliter. During the day, one gram of glucose will normally raise Andrew's blood sugar about seven milligrams per deciliter. But overnight, only about half that amount. So I normally account for about three uh, milligrams per deciliter per uh, uh, gram of glucose that I give him overnight. Um, you really must determine these factors for your child yourself uh, and they will differ from mine almost certainly particularly if your child is younger older you know weighs less you know these are these are my son's factors and i'm providing them just to help as we walk through the examples in a few minutes but you really have to figure these out for your own child they'll be different for everyone so quick note about insulin potency. So the only three insulins that I have any experience in administering to my son are Levomir, Novolin R, and Novolog. And in my experience with those, their potency correlate perfectly with the information provided in chapter 17 of Dr. Bernstein's Diabetes Solution. And that is that Novolog and Levomir have equal potency. Only their times of action differ. Novolin R, or regular, is less potent and by about one-third. So one unit of Novolog is roughly equivalent to one and a half units of Novolin R, or regular. So I've never dosed Humalog, but I felt it was important to note here that Diabetes Solution indicates that Humalog is about two and a half times as potent as regular, or 150% stronger Therefore, one unit of Humalog would have a similar potency as two and a half units of regular. So please keep that in mind as I walk through uh, some of the concepts in the next few slides. So when I'm titrating basal insulin doses, you know, first of all, it's sort of fundamentally important for optimal blood sugar control as incorrect basal doses will lead you to chase low or high blood sugars even during the fasting state. So in my son, as I mentioned on the last slide, Levomir has the same blood sugar lowering impact as Novolog. It just works at a much slower pace. 
Therefore, to titrate his levomere doses, we use the same ratio as we do for Novolog, which during the daytime is 40 milligrams per deciliter of blood sugar drop per one unit of insulin. When we observe higher than target fasting blood sugars that require Novolog correction boluses, and those have been consistent for two to four days, we will typically increase a levomere dose. So in my mind, I think of it as rolling those undesired Novolog correction doses that we had to give into the levomere dose that impacts that troublesome time by lowering it. Conversely, if we observe low fasting blood sugar levels, we want to reduce the relevant levomere dose by the number of units required to correct those undesired lows. We use our understanding of how much one gram of carbohydrate raises blood sugar. Andrew's currently 16 years old. He's six foot three inches tall and weighs about 200 pounds. At this time, one gram of glucose will raise his blood sugar about seven points during the daytime. And so, for example, if he needed to take three grams of glucose prior to lunch or dinner for two days in a row, that would mean he tested around 60 milligrams per deciliter because three grams of glucose will raise him 21 points, then we would consider lowering his 7 a.m. dose of Levomir by one half unit, which would be a 20 point reduction in Levomir action from the 7 a.m. dose. So Andrew's 7 a.m. Levomir dose provides his daytime basal needs. His 9.45 p.m. dose provides part of his overnight needs and his 2 a.m. dose provides the balance of his overnight need. It also combats dawn phenomenon. So we titrate the 7 a.m. basal dose primarily based on fasting blood sugar readings obtained before lunch and before dinner. We titrate the 9.45 p.m. dose primarily based on fasting blood sugar readings obtained at 11.30 p.m. and at 2 a.m and sometimes also 4 a.m. during rough patches. And we titrate the 2 a.m. dose primarily based on fasting blood sugar level upon waking or before breakfast. Basal insulin titration also includes moving doses around in time. Earlier, I described our current basal dosing schedule, but for many years, we dosed Levomir only twice per day at 7 a.m. and 7 p.m. When Andrew was much smaller, that worked fine, and it worked very well until it just didn't work anymore. And then for a while, we were able to dose at 7 a.m. and 9.15 p.m. Then we moved to 7 a.m. and 9.45 p.m. And we finally had to add a third dose at 2 a.m., primarily to combat dawn phenomenon. My point with this slide is to stress that you must strive to find and then do what works for your child and expect that that's going to change over time. And please keep in mind that my examples here are illustrative of concepts. They are not a dosing pattern that you should follow. You must experiment to find what works for your child. So some people use extended fasting for fine tuning their basal doses because fasting completely removes the variables of food and mealtime insulin boluses. I have no problem at all with my son skipping an occasional meal. And if basal doses are set properly, it is perfectly safe to skip a meal. But I've actually not found fasting to be necessary to titrate Andrew's basal insulin. And we titrate his basal, basal insulin doses quite frequently. So now I'd like to talk about titrating mealtime insulin doses. So for titrating mealtime insulin doses, we use a similar method as I described for titrating Levomir. Based on the dose of Novolog or the grams of glucose required to offset any undesired blood glucose outcome. But for meal dose titration, you mostly pay attention to after meal blood sugar outcomes rather than to fasting readings. You'll consider the insulin that was dosed for the meal and the magnitude of the undesired outcome. So let's give an example here. Let's pretend we're going to feed a new recipe. And let's start with a pre-meal blood sugar of 90 milligrams per deciliter. And let's assume that we underestimated the meal's protein impact on blood glucose. As a result, we observe a 20 milligram per deciliter rise at the two hour postprandial mark 
and another 20 point rise at the three hour mark. So now if my son was sitting at 130 milligrams per deciliter, three plus hours past the mill bolus of insulin, I would likely administer one unit of Novolog, probably intermuscularly. And then I would expect that to lower him fairly rapidly to 90 milligrams per deciliter. If that result was achieved by the five to six hour mark, we would then record that data for that meal to inform our insulin dosing next time. In that instance, we would raise the amount of regular for the next meal. And what I am assuming here is my strategy would be to increase the regular dose next time by one and a half units. Recall that Novolog is 50% more potent than regular. So we gave one unit of Novolog to correct the high blood sugar from the meal. So one and a half units of regular would be needed to have an equivalent blood sugar lowering impact. Conversely, if we overestimated the insulin needed for this meal and had a 20 point fall at the two hour mark and then another 20 point fall at the three hour mark, then my son would have taken three grams of glucose each time. He would have likely done that in the form of bottle caps. Um, in that scenario, and wouldn't have had blood sugar drop 40 fewer points from regular, then we will be lowering, lowering the regular by a unit and a half uh, at the next serving of that meal. And then if we had a 20 point drop at first, say the first two hours, followed by a 20 point rise and then a leveling off, then the next time we fed the meal, we might reduce the, the delay between the injection of regular and the eating of the meal. Or we might add two to three blueberries to the meal and leave the insulin dose and timing the same, just sort of depending on the circumstances. So at least in children, meals are really not set it and forget it, at least not forever. Uh, instead, each meal is an exercise in using what happened last time to predict what will happen this time, and then using this time's outcome to make a better prediction for next time. And the backdrop of that is a growing child whose body is always changing. So as parents, we have to always adapt. And my recommendation is to adopt a continuous improvement mindset where it just becomes habit to record what you do and what its outcome is and use that information to inform what you do next time. That's the end of my talk today. I hope that it was helpful. Thank you very much for listening.